Lord. All right, so today what we need to talk about, ladies and gentlemen, is the Arrhenius equation. All right? We need to relate this Arrhenius equation back to the activation energy, and then we're going to wrap up our study of kinetics by discussing the catalyst. Now, everyone remembers what activation energy is, right? What is activation energy? Energy needed to activate. The energy needed to initiate the reaction, all right? Where do you, you can't start the reaction unless the molecules have that amount of energy, all right? So we're going to talk about the Arrhenius equation. We're going to learn how to make graphs of the Arrhenius equation to calculate the value of the activation energy, all right? And then talk about catalysts, as I said. Now, do you guys remember Arrhenius last year when we were talking about acid base theory? It's the same guy. All right. All right. I want us to start by looking at a potential energy diagram. Now, in this particular reaction, we're going from this molecule to this molecule. So you notice a very subtle change. But that's the reaction. So this is my reactant, all right? And then if there's enough energy, it can go up here. What do we call the top of the potential energy diagram? The activated complex or transition state. And this is a very high energy state, all right? Because look what is hypotheses to be occurring at the transition state. Look what's happening to the bonding up here. Switch. Look how distorted this is. It's neither one nor the other. Right? It's some in between. Because at the transition state, that's where we're breaking old bonds and forming new bonds. Right? But you have to have enough energy to be able to achieve this high energy state. And then um, there is a net energy uh, advantage. And this is an exothermic process overall. Right? So the delta E is the difference in energy between the reactants and products. And then the activation energy is the energy from the re reactant up to that transition state. Now, people realized quite a long time ago that when the temperature increases, reaction rates tend to increase. If you, speed it, if you heat it up, it's going to go faster. And there was a rule of thumb I remember learning years ago that, you know, for every 10 degree increase, it's approximately a doubling in rate. But that's very much a rule of thumb and certainly not something you want to um, depend on. But the truth is the, the, the increase is nonlinear. And, and um, the increase itself <coughs> depends on three different factors, which all tie back directly to collision theory. So we know that they're related, all right, but it's not a nice, simple, linear relationship. All right. It depends on what proportion of the molecules that are reacting actually have enough energy to achieve the transition state. All right. So what fraction <coughs> of them have enough energy? All right. Remember, there's an energy requirement when they collide. If they don't have enough energy, it doesn't matter. It also depends on how many collisions there are per second. Obviously, the more collisions you have, the more likely you're going to have some of them be effective. Okay. Right, so it's energy, the number of collisions, and the third factor is the orientation. We talked about that yesterday. Um, right. But the number, uh, uh, the, um, number of the collisions that has the correct orientation, the particles have to collide just so. So we've got these three different factors that come into play. And our friend, Svante Arrhenius, put them all together in an equation trying to relate reaction rates to these factors. All right, and that's on the next slide. And I do want you to write the equation down. All right, this is the Arrhenius equation. Oh, I missed part of it. All right, so K, the rate constant, is equal to A, the frequency factor, times E raised to the negative EA over RT. All right, so it's an exponential process. 
So A is a frequency factor, which is really the orientation. Right. And that's not going to really change with temperature, whether or not how frequently the particles collide with an acceptable orientation. T is the temperature in Kelvin. R is the universal gas constant, which we've talked about before. It shows up in all kinds of places. All right. E sub A is the activation energy, and K is the rate constant, which you could determine from initial rate study. Right. So write down this, Arrhenius, this equation. Here's a picture of Arrhenius in his prime. Maybe bow ties will come back into fashion. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> All right. Now, you could use this equation, right, if you had enough information, but, you know, if you don't, you'll know the temperature, and you can find the uh, rate constant of that temperature, but finding, and you can know R. So you, if you know all that, you can calculate the activation energy, right? But that's kind of tricky. There's another way of doing it graphically that I want to show you, all right? Because if you get out your equation sheet, you'll find that this form of the Arrhenius equation is not there. And I think this is under the thermodynamic slash kinetic section, all the way down near the bottom. You won't find this form of the Arrhenius equation. All right. It's a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So that's a form of the Arrhenius equation. But what we did, or I didn't do it, but the college board, is they took the natural log of both sides. All right. So if you take the natural log of the Arrhenius equation, you get this equation, which is on your formula sheet. Right. And it's on your formula sheet and it's really important right, because we can use this form of the equation to calculate the activation energy. Right. Now remember in the lesson we did on, I think it was on Tuesday, the integrated rate laws, we had the integrated rate laws and we related them to y equals mx plus b. Can we do that with this equation? Yeah. Yeah, so let's do that. All right. So if we look at y equals mx plus b, what would y correspond to? The ln of k, right? So this is our y-axis. All right. What's our y-intercept? The ln of a. What are we going to plot along, what variable will we plot along the x-axis? What will it be? What experimental measure thing can we measure directly that we could plot along the x-axis? Yeah. But EA is what we're trying to find. Do we, we don't know that directly. T, we know 1 over T, right? All right. So x would be 1 over T temperature in Kelvin. It's got to be in Kelvin. Right. So here's what we're going to end up doing. If we plot the, the natural log of K on the y-axis and 1 over T on the x-axis, <laughs> all right, what would the slope be? Negative. Be negative Ea over R. And we know R because that's the universal gas constant. All right. So that's everything we need to know. You need to know this information. And we'll show a graph of it in one second, once I know everyone's got this written down. Right, can I go to the next slide? All right, so here is the type of graph you would get. All right, you'd plot ln of k. You'd plot, you'd, you would count, you'd have to do your re initial rate studies to something along those lines at different temperatures. Right. Calculate K, take the natural log. You've done it, done these experiments at different temperatures. So you take the reciprocal of the temperature, 1 over T, and you plot it, and you should get a nice straight line. All right. And the slope equals negative EA over R. All right. And so you know R, you can determine the slope, you can then find EA very easily with a little bit of algebra. Should you be able to describe this process in sentence form? Yes. yes. That's the most likely 
analysis you'd be asked to do is, how would you do this? Explain how you would use this data to find the activation energy. It's unlikely in the middle of the AP exam that you'd actually have to calculate it. Because if you have a graphing calculator, it's a piece of cake. And if you don't, you're at a severe disadvantage. So they tend not to do questions that rely that heavily on the graphing calculators, at least as far as I tell. All right. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about were catalysts. All right. They tie in very neatly here. All right. And hopefully you remember that catalysts cause the rate of reaction to increase without being consumed themselves. So at the end of the reaction, you still have your catalyst. It's been regenerated in its original form, perhaps. Right. There's a lot of study in catalysts, because catalysts can do lots of interesting things. Um, the catalyst may be homogeneous, meaning it's in the same phase as the reactant. Enzymes in your body tend to be homogeneous catalysts. Or they may be heterogeneous catalysts, which is what I've shown here. Right? This is what's going on in a catalytic converter, right? where you've got gases that adhere to the surface of a metal, and this brings them together in an appropriate orientation. And then they can react. Um, catalysts are awesome. We love catalysts. We wouldn't be allowed without them. All right. Now, enzymes are biological catalysts. They're proteins that cause reactions to go faster. All right. The reactants enter the active site, and by doing this, the enzyme is bringing the reactants together in the correct orientation, which means that they're going to, uh, you're not going to have any loss due to poor orientation. See, it minimizes your ineffective collisions, and that drastically increases the rate. So in the top picture, this is showing um, catalase from liver extracts decomposing hydrogen peroxide. The lower picture is the lock and key model. What you really need to be responsible for knowing about enzymes, or catalysts in general, is how they make the reactions go faster. Um, I just really love proteins. So, um, this is so these are some X-ray crystallography sh pictures of a prote protein, and then this is the active site of nitrogenase, which is an important thing. But you can see that the active site is all inorganic. So even though it's in this organic framework of the, the enzyme, it's an inorganic group that's really doing the chemistry. And there's a lot of research in trying to make analogs to this that are synthetic can do the same work as nitrogenase. But that's a separate thing. All right, what you really need to know about catalysts relates to the potential energy diagram. This is the very first slide we looked at, all right? The number one thing you need to know about catalysts, after knowing that they make reactions go faster, is that they lower the activation energy. They don't change the energy of the reactants, they don't change the energy of the products, but they do lower the activation energy. So the red curve here is the uncatalyzed reaction. It's got a certain activation energy. And the blue curve is the catalyzed reaction, which is actually, in this case, occurring by a different mechanism. And that's why we're getting different curves. All right. But the activation energy is lower. All right. And so it's going to go faster, because you're assuming all else is staying the same. Sound OK? Any questions? Shall we stop here then? Sure. Seems like a good place to.